Um, and one of the biggest things that it says in the end times is that there's going to be a mass deception. Right. Uh, this is one of the biggest characteristics of, of the end times, a spirit of delusion, of deception, that people are going to be blinded. It's going to be as if there's a veil covering their eyes that they're not going to literally not going to see what's, right. in, what's so clearly in front of them. You know, right. we've talked about it over the past weeks about the amazing, um, I don't even know the word for it, the, <laughs> the shockingness of where the radical left agenda has taken things. Um, we went from, okay, gay marriage is acceptable to now you can be a cat and have a litter box in the classroom. And, you know, all manner of bizarreness, everything, it's, it's like the scripture in the Bible that said whatever evil thing their mind could conceive, right. whatever thing that their minds were meditating on, that's as far as they're taking it. And we're living in a day and age in which evil is called good and good is called evil. And to the extent where, you know, 50 years ago, things that people knew were not good, people knew were not acceptable, are being promoted as acceptable alternative lifestyles. And this is okay. It's normal. It's good. No, there's nothing good and there's nothing there normal not. about it. And anybody with a clear thinking that's thinking biblically based right. can see that. Um, however, there has been a lot of deception that has even crept into the church. Um, as far as accepting things, um, you have pastors that say that it's okay to be gay and they accept gay members into the church and, and allow them to stay that way. I'm not saying you don't open the doors and allow them to come in where they could be changed, be by, changed. Right. by the presence of God, but okay, this isn't okay. We gotta be accepting. We gotta, we gotta show that we have love for all. And the danger of that is it's like the Ephesian church and the churches of Revel Revelation, where they got to the point where they were so open to compromise that they almost became lulled to sleep That's right. by the world around them. Um, Rick Renner does some amazing teachings on the churches of Revelation and the similarities to their, their situation and the modern church, especially in the Western world. Right. Not so much in the Eastern world, because you still find that the church in the Eastern world is persecuted. So they're not going to get into it to be in, in a social club. There's not, they're not going to get into it. Oh, this is just the in thing to do. No, they're doing it at risk to their lives. Right. So they're the more committed Christians, oftentimes, than those in the West. Um, but I believe that in the end times, Yahweh wants a spirit of revival to come upon the church, to come upon the body Awakening. of the Messiah and awaken them to the truth, awaken them to the, to the roots. And when you start looking at the roots, you know, you can tell... tell what kind of tree it is by the I fruit, the but you got to get back to the root. And, and, you know, talk about that with how we support Israel. You don't support the root, the root supports you. And you can't have the fruit without the root. Right. You know, you can't say, well, I, you know, I really like this, but I don't like the tree that it came off of. Well, the tree and the fruit are one, one. and the same. That's right. And so there's a lot of, and we've done this before, um, dad did this when he was talking about the origins of, of Christmas and the origins of Easter and the things that, that are t so tied into um, ancient gods, the, the, paganism. the ancient paganism. paganism. And the church tries to divorce itself from the pagan roots of those uh, celebrations and, and try to <laughs> sanctify it. And you see throughout history of the church, the, the popes and the, the Roman Empire, they tried to sanctify pagan celebrations. And you, so you end up with Valentine's Day, you end up with all these things, and they try to Christianize it. But Christianizing something does not remove the pagan roots from it. Right. You can take oranges on an apple tree, but it doesn't change the fact that it's an apple tree. And you right. can say all you want, oh, that's such a beautiful orange tree. It's not an orange tree. The root says it's an apple tree. Man. Uh, so you can't change something. You know, it says, the, can a leopard change his spots in the Bible? You can't change something the way from what Yahweh intended it to be. Any more than you can change a male to say he is a female now. Right. Uh, you can't go through any, no, I don't care what kind of surgery you go through to try to say that at the DNA. You look yeah, at that DNA. That's right. And they're going to say that that was a male. Right. Not a female. X and a Y. <laughs> you know, Chromosome. it's very simple. Um, and so some things 
do shouldn't be as difficult to understand as they are. Mm-hmm. But again, because of the culture around us that has so almost tried to lull us to sleep, or as it says in, in, in Romans, they tried to squeeze us into their That's mold. Right. That's right. Um, they've caused us to accept things and push the church world to accept things as being okay and normal, which are not okay and normal. And we have a big one coming up this weekend, and it's Halloween. Okay, um, you look at, just if you do a search on the history of Halloween and if Christians should celebrate Halloween, you see that the church is very divided over it. Should Christians celebrate Halloween? And you're going to see some people that say, yes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good outreach. way it's of outreach. outreach. It's a good way of witnessing to the world. It's a good way. We got to take the holiday back for God. Well, was the holiday... What? Ever. ever gods that's right it and there's wasn't. you have to really stretch it and some of these sherry and i were going over this last night and some of these people really have to stretch absolutely really have to stretch to try to make twist the word to say something that it doesn't say <laughs> yep. oh, and to try to connect the the christianizing of halloween and say that this is this is why we are celebrating this but you can't get rid of the roots yep. and so i wanted to get into um, and forgive me, I am speaking off of my phone today because none of our printers decided that they wanted to print yeah, out this message. That, huh? Who's behind that? Who's behind that? And the then I, I had the notes, and it for some reason it only saved one line of my notes. But so, mom came. But to mom the rescue. came to the rescue. I called her right before the service, and I'm like, I need my notes. It's coming out so, the door, and it's like, good thing. Uh, timing is everything. Timing is everything. Yes, yeah. indeed. And so I wanted to read some of this to you, and it's going to be a bit heavy in history. Uh, and we're going to be a little bit heavy into the dark side at first, because you need to know this is why the children are not in the room. That's you right. know, we, we want to, in this place, we want to protect our children from the darkness. You, there's some things that at their ages, they don't even need to know about. Nope. They don't even need to be exposed about. Any more than a kindergartner needs to be exposed to the all manners of sexual perversion the that they're queen. trying to put into the schools. <laughs> there's no need for children at certain ages to be exposed to it. Well. If we're going to be talking about it, we don't really want them to be exposed to it here because then it puts right. the ideas in their mind. Trying to cover their eyes tra- riding down the street. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, all you have to do is drive down the street. And how many of you have noticed the darkness of Halloween gotten has gotten even darker? <clears throat> I mean, I can remember even when I was little, I mean, they had their little jack-o'-lanterns and ghosts and whatever. Did. We never did. We no, never I'm saying, did. but driving but, around, right. you would see it. But it was never as dark as it is now. And it's, I mean, it's gotten, it's evil. like what's going on out there when it comes to, can we push the envelope? Will you accept gay marriage? Will you accept this now? Now will you accept this level? It's the same thing with this. The devil is not going to stop there. You give him an inch, he's going to take a mile. And he's going to keep pushing the envelope. And so the roots of Halloween are based in, an, in, in, a, in a Celtic origin, um, in an but it goes back further than that, as we will see later. So, Samhain is a pagan religious festival originating from an ancient Celtic spiritual tradition. In modern times, Samhain is usually celebrated from October 31st to November 1st to welcome in the harvest and usher in the dark half of the year. See, the focus is already on dark. the darkness. Mm-hmm. Uh, celebrants believe that the Barriers between the physical world and the spirit world break down during Samhain, allowing more interaction between humans and occupants of the other world. Right. Now, some Christians will look at that and say, oh, that's, that's a bunch of baloney. You can't do that. They're not giving enough credit to the dark side because there are some people who have entered into, and we're going to get into that a little bit later, right. have been involved in that side, and they say it's very much real. See, that's what Christians need to realize. Don't underestimate your enemy. Know that this stuff is real. Right. You start messing into some of these areas and you get a lot more than you bargained for. Um, they believe that the ghosts of the dead return to earth and both friendly and hostile supernatural powers cross over during this time. They do too. They actually, <laughs> they do. actually do. Samhain, the god of death, scattered evil spirits during this time throughout the world to attack humans. These evil spirits play nasty tricks as soon as the dark winter and the waning of the sun set in. To escape the attack, humans would assume disguises and make themselves look like evil spirits too. 
origins of dressing in costumes. costumes. Um, in addition to causing trouble and damaging crops, the ancient Celts thought that the presence of the otherworldly spirits made it easier for the Druids, everybody hear of the Druids, the, they're the Celtic priests back then, to make predictions about the future, so fortune telling. For a people entirely dependent on the volatile natural world, these prophecies were an important source of comfort and direction during the long winter. And they also opened them up to other spirits. Right. Even today, predictions of leading psychics and astrologers are generally released about the time of Halloween, as divination or fortune telling is also believed to reach its highest powers on Halloween. This is what the dark side believes. Um, so the, the Celtic festival of Samhain, they lived about 2,000 years ago. The Celts the, lived about 2,000 years ago in the area that is now Ireland, the United Kingdom, and northern France. And they celebrated it as their new year. They marked Samhain as the most significant of the four quarterly fire festivals. So you know how Yahweh has his calendar? We talk about Yahweh mm -hmm. having his calendar. Right. Well, the enemy does what to what? things that Yahweh does. He counterfeits Counting them. It, so so right. he takes something that Yahweh Twist sets them. and says, well, I'm going to create my own things. I'm going to create my own calendar. Yep. And if you look at what falls on that calendar, you have the Yule. Well, that's right around Christmas time. You have, you have May Day. How many of you know about May Day? You know the origins of May Day. Go look at the origins of May Day sometime. It's interesting. And one of them was Samhain in the fall time. Uh, during this time of year, hearth fires burned in family homes, and they were left to burn out while the harvest was gathered. After the harvest work was complete, celebrants joined with the Druid priests to light a community fire using a wheel that would cause friction and spark flames. The wheel was considered a representation of the sun and used along with prayers. Now, these weren't prayers to God. You know that. Cattle were sacrificed. Participants took a flame from the co communal bonfire back to their home to relight their hearth. So they're partaking in what's going on here and carrying it, and into, carrying their it into their homes. Okay. Early texts present Samhain as a mandatory celebration lasting three days and three nights where the community was required to show themselves to local kings or chieftains. Failure to participate was believed to result in punishment from the gods, usually illness or death. So it's a dark, very dark and evil. Some documents mention six days of drinking alcohol to excess, typically beer, along with gluttonous feasts. Well, right there, you can see that that's against the Bible. <laughs> the Proverbs has a lot to say about that. Um, because the Celts believed that the barrier between worlds was breachable during Samhain, they prepared offerings that were left outside villages and fields for spirits. The Celtic people believe that on the night of October 31st, demons, witches, and the spirits of all those who had died within the past year roamed about freely. Most people were afraid to leave their homes that night. Uh, those who absolutely had to go out wore grotesque masks and terrifying costumes. So they were, they were into the dark side of that. They reasoned if they looked horrible enough, the spirits would think they were one of them and would do them no harm. Fear is a big part of modern Halloween celebrations as well. I mean, how many times do they say, oh, it's spooky, and they use all these words to describe something that's fearful, to invoke fear. There's right. enough fear going on in the world out there without creating an entire day to celebrate fear. Right. Spooky decorations, horror movies, and haunted houses make a very real impression on little children. Yes, they do. They're very, very much so. And that sticks with them throughout their lives. Is there any wonder so many youth have nightmares or are afraid of the dark? Well, you go and bring them into these places and expose them to these things, it's going to get inside of them. Satan delights in filling people's minds with the thought of fear, death, and destruction. It's a tactic he has used for centuries to keep mankind under his control. Right. As the Middle Ages progressed, so did the celebrations of the fire festivals, as they called them. Bonfires, known as, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, were more personal than the Samhain fires. Near farms became a tradition to protect families from fairies and witches. So they'd light their own little personal fires to protect them. Uh, anybody know where the tradition of the jack-o'-lantern came from? 
it's actually kind of humorous. I said, this one is just like so far out there. So the tradition of carving jack-o'-lanterns originated in Ireland using turnips instead of pumpkins. So it was originally turnips. It's allegedly based on this legend about a man named Stingy Jack. And Stingy Jack was, uh, was he was, lived such a bad life and he gets to the end of his life and he basically, um, he was trapping the devil. So he trapped the devil in a tree. <laughs> this is how it goes. He traps the devil in a tree and wouldn't let him down because he made the sign of the cross underneath him. So the devil won't go past the cross. So the devil is stuck in this tree. So he lets the devil down onto the tree. He says, I'll erase the cross on the condition that you will not take me to hell with you. You will not, when I die, you're not gonna, you're not gonna let me come into hell. So the devil says, okay, it's a deal. Uh, he made a deal with the devil. <laughs> so when he died, when Jack died, the devil kept his promise, which just shows you how much of a legend this is because the devil never keeps his promises. He, w he wouldn't allow Jack into he he hell, but heaven wouldn't allow Jack into heaven because he had lived such a bad life. So now Jack is stuck wandering around and he's, he's, he's doomed to wander the earth and roam around as a departed spirit. And as he's departing, the devil throws this coal at Jack, who happens to be eating a turnip at the time. Why he was eating a turnip? Not sure. But he throws this coal at him and it goes inside the turnip and lights up the turnip so that lights Jack's way as he roams about through the night. That's where the jack-o'-lantern came from. Does that sound like something we want to partake in? No. Um, locals eventually became, began carving scary faces into their own turnips and then scary pumpkins faces. to frighten away evil spirits. Um, we'll get into a little bit more how, how real it is to the demonic side when you're carving things into pumpkins. Right. Not talking about like in the summertime, oh yeah, I, made it, I painted a pumpkin. It's, it's specific to this and what right. they do with it. Um, in Wales, to celebrate Samhain, men tossed burning wood at each other in violent games. <laughs> and they set off fireworks. In Northern England, men paraded with noisemakers. So it's all this raucousness and like all this stuff going on. Then there's the tradition of the dumb supper. The tradition of dumb supper began during the same time. The feast of the dead was laid out to welcome those returning to haunt their previous home. This is where all these haunted house things came from. Food was consumed by celebrants, but only after inviting ancestors to join in, giving the families a chance to interact with the spirits until they left following dinner. I mean, what are they partaking in? Reminds me of when Paul says, can you partake in the table of the Lord and the table of demons at the same time? Right. Children during this feast would play games to entertain the dead, while adults would update the dead on the past year's news. So they have a news session there. <laughs> that night, doors and windows might be left open for the dead to come in and eat cakes that had been left for them. Kind of sounds like Santa Claus. <laughs> The Feast of the Dead is still prominent it and is. popular it among is. witches today. That's right. uh, witches will gather and they, they chant. You know, they always have their chants. found this thing this uh, pastor was talking about. One of the chants that they say is, So it is set time to gather again, the Feast of our Dead to begin. Our ancients, our ancestors, we invite to come and follow the setting of the sun. Whom do we call? We call them by name. And then they start naming all these people that they're summoning up. It's totally against the Bible, totally against anything the Bible says. We'll see later. Um, let's see. I just went past it. I'm not used to doing it off of here. Okay. So as part of their worship of Samhain, now remember, Samhain is the god of death. So they're worshiping the god of death. That's the basis of this entire celebration is worshiping the God of death. The Druids would sacrifice both animals and humans. May I say to you that there are still witches out there that are oh, yeah, still sure. sacrificing well, both animals and on. humans. Well, the kidnappings going on. You ever wonder, go look at the list of kidnappings that happen around Halloween. The people who have been into the satanic temple and into the dark side will tell you 
that that's what they do. They kidnap people to sacrifice them to appease the gods. This is, and this is going on in the 21st century. This isn't ancient Celtic times anymore, but it's still going on. But the term bonfire literally means bone fire. So you talk about all the bonfires that they have. Oh, we're going to have a bonfire on for Halloween. They just left the E off. A bone <laughs> fire. And it was because the bones of the sacrificed humans and animals were piled in a field and set on fire. The barbaric practice continued openly for hundreds of years until Rome conquered Britain and outlawed it. But it still was practiced in secret places. Years passed and Rome continued to conquer new territory and increase in power. The people of each conquered nation were forced not only to become Roman citizens, but also to become members of the Roman church. So you become, you, you're now under our power, so you're a part of the Roman church. As you can imagine, these new converts cared very little about their Christianity and clung tenaciously to their pagan practices. They weren't true converts. They just did, you know, hold a gun to somebody's head. They're not really converting. They're, they're, they're just going to do it because they don't want to die. Um, so since the Roman church was unable to get people to abandon their heathen festivals, it decided to sanctify some of them. So, okay, well, we'll just make them holy. Um, Pope Boniface began this in the 5th century and moved the celebration of Samhain to May 13th and specified it as a day celebrating saints and martyrs. It sounds so much better, but it's really not that much better. The fire festivals of October and November did not end with this decree, however. In the 9th century, Pope Gregory moved the celebration back to the time of the, tire fe the fire festivals, but declared it All Saints Day. Everybody hear that? All Saints Day. Now we're going to call it All Saints Day. All Souls Day would follow on November 2nd. So All Saints Day, All Souls Day sounds better, but the Druid celebration in honor of the Lord of Death thus became All Saints Day. Did not sanctify the day. No, it didn't. It just changed the name of it. So it right. sounds better. Um, which was to be observed by all churches. Officially, it was proclaimed as a day to honor all the saints who had died, known or unknown. But in practice, it remained what it had always been, a pagan celebration of the Day of the Dead. It was still practiced in the church. Uh, neither new holiday did away with the pagan aspects of the celebration. October 31st then became known as All Hallows' Eve, which was run into Halloween and contained much of the traditional pagan practices before being adopted in 19th century America through Irish immigrants bringing their traditions across the ocean. Several days before their festival began, the Druid priests would go from house to house demanding food or other items that they would use in their worship of Samhain. If a villager refused to give them what they wanted, the priest would put a demonic curse on that house. It was no idle threat either. See, these things are real. The Bible says a causeless curse will not alight, but only if we have the power of God inside of us that annuls the curse. Um, someone from that house usually died within the year. So people, you know, go down to Haiti and see Haiti what the voodoo, the voodooism right. that, that they still carries true. all this. They know the truth of it. Sure now, by the way, <laughs> this is kind of a side note here, but you go to Haiti, you go to Africa, you go to any of these other places where they do have that kind of satanic, the voodoo, um, the worshiping of the devil in the culture. And the Christians in those nations are shocked that Christians in America celebrate Halloween. Mm -hmm. they're, they're like, what are you doing? Like, they came out of that. They were delivered from it. They know right. the power of that darkness. Right. So they're like, why are you having anything to do with it? They don't understand it. They, there's nothing in them that can understand it. Right. Um, so usually the, someone within the house would die within the year of that Druid priest putting the curse on their house. Uh, it's from that practice that trick-or-treating evolved. Them going house to house asking for things. It was a trick or a treat. You give me a treat so I won't put a trick or a curse on your house. In Ireland, mumming was the practice of putting on costumes, going door to door, and singing songs to the dead. <laughs> I mean, it's not the innocent thing that it seems like. It really is not. Cakes were given as payment. During the time of the Roman Empire, there was the custom of eating or giving away fruit, especially apples, on Halloween. 
spread to neighboring countries, and it's probably based upon a celebration of the Roman goddess Pomona, who, to whom gardens and orchards were dedicated. The annual Feast of Pomona was held on November 1st. So the P Feast of Pomona, she's the goddess of, of, you know, fruit and all that, and it was all tied up into their sex cults and everything, too. And so that's where the bobbing for apples tradition came from. Bobbing for apples, it has to do with the worship of Pomona, the goddess of the fruit. Halloween is a favorite time of year for witches or the advocates of Wicca. Wicca is the official religion of witch witchcraft. Wiccan adherents believe that, as their ancestors did, on the night of October 31st, the separation of physical and spiritual realities is at its thinnest and least guarded. You ever notice that around this time, things just seem to go zooey? You notice that, like, okay, people are acting really weird, or, like, there seems to be a lot of things that are happening outside of the normal. It's because of the time. Just like Yahweh has his moeds that... There's, a, there's an opening in which there's more of a, an opportunity for you to meet with Yahweh, more of an right, opportunity for you to receive from him, more of an opportunity to be in his presence. Right. The devil counterfeits that, and on his days, there's more of an opportunity to be in his presence. Right. Which presence do you want to be in? Um, and so it's the best time. Halloween is the best time for those who have necromantic abilities to speak to the dead. Um, let's see. In the Druid tradition, Samhain celebrates the dead with a festival. American pagans often hold music and dance celebrations called witches balls. They're very prominent yeah, in Massachusetts. They, they are. They absolutely are. They actually are. are very, very prominent. Big advertisements. About in them proximity and to Samhain. Oh. Um, I'm going to read a couple of things that I found on the internet about these witches' balls that are taking place. Uh, Salem is, let's just say it's crawling with them right now. This absolutely. entire weekend is full of pagan celebrations out there. It's celebrating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they are celebrating. But clearly, the rites and symbols of this holiday reveal that it's a holiday that glorifies Satan. There's nothing that's glorifying God about this thing. Even a month before October 31st, you start seeing all these pictures of ghosts and goblins and ghouls and all kinds of stuff in the window. And bookstores will start having, giving great attention to books that deal with the occult. There's nothing glorifying God about that. As Christians, we are not to associate with the things of Satan. Yeshua himself said, no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't cross over between the two of them. Ephesians 5.11 says, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. No fellowship. Have nothing to do with them, but instead reprove them. Satan is no doubt jubilant that such a large portion of this Christian nation views a holiday in his honor as something that is harmless fun. Could it be that by our carelessness, we are contributing to the extraordinary power Satan seems to have on October 31st? Um, syncretism, the merging of Christianity and paganism, is absolutely unacceptable to our Heavenly Father. Right. They have nothing to do with each other. We must never use pagan practices in worshiping God. We'll turn here after, but in Deuteronomy chapter 18, witchcraft is clearly detestable to right. the Lord. Shouldn't something that glorifies witchcraft, just take a walk through, actually don't, but if you take a walk through the local Halloween store, uh, shouldn't that be detestable to us as well because it's glorifying witchcraft? Halloween is a sacred high holiday for Wiccans. Is this a holiday Christians should celebrate alongside Wiccans? No. So this is from one witch's ball that's happening around here. Whether you are preparing for the time, the dark time of the year, a time for introspection, or, or celebrating your outer self in our most sacred Sabbath. See, they eat, this is a, called a high holy day in their year. It's called a high Sabbath, S-A-B-B-A-T. It's an offshoot of the Sabbath. Of course it is. 
See, Satan just tries to copy things right. that, that Yahweh already has in place. So they're calling you to come and join them on their most sacred Sabbath. For one magic educator, Samhain is a part of a season of holidays that honor the dead and the dark side of life. It's the time of the year when the veil between worlds is at its thinnest, meaning that it's much easier to speak to those who have moved on from this life during that time. On Halloween, one tarot and magic expert places candles on her ancestral altar to provide light and warmth to guide her ancestors back for a visit. By the way, those are familiar spirits. Absolutely. They're not even Absolutely. the ancestors. You can't call back the ancestors, but what you are delving into is familiar spirits. And those are real. They are. Familiar spirits are very real. They are. Um, a coven leader summons her ancestors. I try to tell them everything, good and bad, and honestly, it always sounds a lot like gossip, she says. There's no one right way to summon an ancestor, and some witches use darker means, including necromancy. So they're saying nothing. It doesn't matter how you do it. So all, it's okay. You're, you're doing it. It's all right. Um, and there's one which, who happens to be an attorney, you want to make sure you get the right attorneys if you ever have to, <laughs> an attorney brews potions made from branches and leaves, raw alligator, and poisonous snake flesh. She brews her concoctions in a huge stock pot using a witchy recipe book handed down from her grandmother. I always brew some concoction usually aimed at complicating the lives of those people who annoyed me the most the past year. So they believe in this stuff. They do believe in this stuff. On Samhain, one person may hold unbaptisms and black masses at the Satanic Temple's headquarters located in Salem, Massachusetts. So they have an unbaptism and a black mass. An unbaptism is a ritual some witches and others use to separate themselves from religious oppression. Uh, according to them, a black mass can also ser serve as a ceremony of blasphemy and liberation, as well as a tool for manifestation. In other words, these are very dark ceremonies that are taking place. Uh, a priest at the Cabot Kent Hermetic Temple in Salem, there's a lot of temples in Salem, makes a pilgrimage to his hometown of Salem to attend a witch's ball that's been held annually since 1970. There, he says, dresses, he dresses in ceremonial garb, intended to attract the powers and correspondences we want more of in the coming year. So they dress up in costume, and it has a whole different meaning. Some witches carve pumpkins with magically charged symbols. The sweet and nourishing magic of the pumpkin with a flame inside holds and projects these symbols a powerful way. Whatever symbol you carve into a pumpkin can be a magic spell if you do it with intention. Stay away from carving pumpkins. If there's something that this witch wants to manifest in her own life, she thinks of a symbol to represent her intention and carves it into the pumpkin. This is darkness. This is, is darkness. darkness. Is it cute when we dress our children like the devil or witches or ghosts or demons? Isn't it, well, demonic? Yes. <laughs> The Lord said in 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from among them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing. Don't even have anything to do with it. Doesn't God want his children to be set apart from the world and sin and evil? Aren't we supposed to be a peculiar people? And that's one of the biggest things. Well, my family won't understand if I don't let my children go trick-or-treating, I'm keeping them from something and all that. We're supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be like the world around us. We're supposed to be set apart. It's okay to be different. You know, I saw this, um, this one woman who has, she has a YouTube channel and she used to be a witch. She used to be into the cult and all that type of stuff and uh, praise the Lord she was saved from it and she's now on fire serving the Lord and letting people know from her position as being into that, she's like, I can speak. I was in it. I was involved in it. I saw things. I experienced right. things. You don't want anything to do with this. But she said her own daughter is 12 years old, and she said that some of her family will be like, well, don't you feel like you're missing out on, like, missing out on something? Like, you don't get the candy? And she's like, all right, number one, just thinking, she's like, most parents, do they not have any candy in the house ever throughout the rest of the year for their children? 
Like, do they, do they not have any candy in their house? Like, is this the one time of the year the child will ever taste candy? Most of them have houses that have candy in them. She's like, and most parents will go to the store and buy the candy for them. How weird would it be for somebody to go to their old neighbor John's house on January 1st and go ask him for candy? Like you think of it, put it in any other time in the year. Let me go to your house and ask you for candy. Well, why can't your mother get you candy? Go ask your mother, <laughs> you know? And she said, you know, how did this get so twisted? It's, it's not, you're not depriving them of something. You can either say yes or no, that you're having the candy or you're not having candy. It's something that you can provide for them. Why would they go and beg it off of strangers? Why would they even need to be involved in that? And so her daughter, knowing her mother's uh, background and the history in it, um, she, this, this woman said that on Halloween, they would, they would take it, they would count up all, they would save their pennies and go all out for Halloween as she lived with these witches. And they would, they would, they would take drugs to alter their mind so that they could get into a spiritual trance and really get into the place where they could communicate with the other world. And this one particular Halloween, she talked about, she had started having these different things that were going on in her life. And so she, she takes these drugs and she passes out. And nothing, they were, they were summoning up spirits and ancestors and gods and I don't know what else they were summoning up. And she said she woke up and something had taken over her. She said, I just, I was a different person after that point. Like I, it cha literally changed my personality that night of Halloween. And she said, and I, after that, she started having actual physical manifestations happening. Doors slamming, light bulbs breaking, all kinds of stuff. The spirits were running the house. Well, you asked them in, you invited them in. Now they, now they control the place. And so she, um, she finally got to the point where she was so terrified of what she was seeing. She said, I didn't yet know God. I was not like, oh, I need to turn to God. No, I just was so terrified of what was happening and all this stuff and that I couldn't control it. I needed it out. So she got out. She ended up on the streets. Long story short, she ended up getting arrested because she was on drugs and all this stuff. She was ministered to in the police car by this woman. She said, I don't to this day know who this woman was, but she started saying to her, you're more than this. You have a life ahead of you that you can serve God. God can save you from this. And so in jail, she turned her life over to the Lord. Months and months later, she was at a, at a church service and she's like, my life is going much better now. And then they had a deliverance service. You know, anybody who needs deliverance from their past, deliverance from any evil spirits. And she's like, well, I think it might be good to, to go to this thing. And she said, and I was shocked. She's like, because I step up there and all of a sudden something takes over me and literally my mouth starts speaking things that I'm not saying. And I start trying to attack the woman who's doing the deliverance. She said, it took three men to hold me back. And she's like, and finally, you know, they, they cast the spirit out of her. She's like, I tapped into all that by my actions and by right. how I started getting engaged in this stuff. I tapped into it and she said, I let them in but now we're completely free. But she's like, don't have anything to do with this. Don't have anything to do with it. Um, Antoine LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan and the author of the Satanic Bible, says that Satanists consider Halloween the most important day of the year. He says that on this night, Satanic, occult, and witchcraft power are at their highest potency level, and that any witch or occultist who has been having difficulty with a spell or curse can usually achieve success on October 31st because Satan and his powers are at their best that night. He himself declared that by dressing up, either by wearing a costume or by coloring yourself in celebration of Halloween, it signifies that you allow Satan to own you. Hallelujah. Take it from the head. By dressing up, you are allowing Satan to own you. I don't care if you try to say, well, no, I'm not doing it in that sense. It's embedded in the tradition itself. That's right. By and doing Satan that, takes it serious. Satan takes it seriously, just as right. he, takes, he takes your words seriously. Right. Well, I didn't really mean it. Oh, yeah, I'm dying to go there. Well, I didn't really mean it. He takes you at your word, and he right. takes your actions very seriously. Um, he further said that when you adopt the pagan practices, you subconsciously dedicate yourself to the devil. He took joy in Christians who take part in the tradition, saying, I am glad 
This is from the head of the church of Satan. I am glad that Christian parents let their children worship the devil at least one night out of the year. Welcome to Halloween. Amen. See, the demonic side takes Amen. great delight in that. Great. Right. You're, you, you let them worship me one, one day a year? I have a win. And then they wonder why they have to go and have these deliverance services and cast demons out of them. And then they go and celebrate Halloween. They wonder why they're all cutting. Or cutting, and you know, that's, suicide that's and... really a big thing. Every single person I was listening to who was talking about getting involved in the occult, getting involved in this, well, cutting cutters. went along with it. Amazingly. Uh, LeVay's statement is corroborated by a former Satanist, John Ramirez. He's now an evangelist. Um, mm -hmm. He spent much of his early life, I think it was from the age of 8 to 35, something like that, um, with strong ties to the devil. You mean strong ties like drinking animal blood, sacrificing animals, baptized with the devil, and he got married a in a demonic wedding at Halloween. That's how into the devil he was. Now the New York City native is an evangelist who preaches the gospel of Yeshua and deliverance from demons. And every year, I mean, proof that Yahweh can reach anybody. Right, he sure can. Nobody is beyond re re redemption. Right. He, he has tattoos on him that are dedicated, dead in like the mark of the beast and the, the name that only Satan knows and like all these things. But Yahweh was able to save this man. And now he's gone from being the devil's biggest advocate to... Yahweh's biggest advocate. Right. Um, but he wonders every year why believers participate in Halloween festivities. I wonder why people celebrate Halloween these day days, says the 55-year-old. Because in essence, I know what Halloween is about. I was in witchcraft for 25 years, selling my soul to the devil. I was a general for the devil. I was a warlock. He added, have you ever heard a Satanist say, I can't wait for Good Friday to come so I can go to church with you? You ever hear Satanists say that? So why would Christians say, I can't wait for Halloween so that I can dress up? In essence, it's cheating on God. It, is. it really is. Halloween is the most diabolical, demonic holiday, he said. He said he practiced it for 25 years, and you're going to come out of left field and say, as a Christian, it's okay to celebrate it. When you've never lit candles and killed animals and drank animal blood, and sat down with the devil. And you're gonna tell me that Halloween is okay? I think you're very delusional as a believer. You are delusional to think it's okay. He explains Christians should not be deceived when celebrating Halloween alternatives. And this is where the church is really church. starts getting into it. You see it all across this city. You see it all across America. Churches, Big churches. trunk or treat. They're having harvest parties, harvest, anything yeah. that sounds good that's not saying it's on Halloween, but it's on the same time frame. Uh, why would you pick a day, October 31st, and then say you're going to call it harvest? You're going to dress people up. You're going to bring candy. What is the difference between that and Halloween? Right. You can call it all you want, something else, but it's the same thing. Right. You might as well call the devil into your church. That's what you're doing. Man. You're inviting the devil into your church, inviting him to partake of your flock. And pastors will be accountable for that. Yeah. They really will be. Absolutely. He said that when you dress up even as an angel or a mermaid for Halloween, you give the devil legal rights to change your identity. Right. What was the origins of it? I'm going to identify as this so that I don't look like who I am, so they'll think I'm that. What is the devil trying to do all over America now? Right. All across the world, really. Trying to change people's identity. They're giving him the open door. Right. Ramirez further warned that there's much darker reality in Halloween beyond costumes and candy. He says, I was a general to the kingdom of darkness and witchcraft. I would sit with the devil and talk to him like I'm talking to you today. It was that kind of communication. It was that kind of rela rela relationship. He firmly believes that Christians should not partake in this holiday, even not even if they rename it as Harvest Fest or right. any other similar Christianized version of Halloween. The only harvest we should celebrate is the harvest of souls. And may right. I add, there is a harvest Sukkot. festival, and it's called Sukkot. It's called Sukkot. That's, That's what right. Sukkot is all about. That's right. Celebrating the harvest. You want to celebrate the harvest? Celebrate it during Sukkot. Celebrate it right. during the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. Um, 
A pastor, Jamie Morgan, of Life Church in New Jersey said, setting aside a day to celebrate evil, darkness, witchcraft, fear, death, and the demonic brings disdain to God, period. A Christian celebrating Halloween would be like a Satan worshiper putting up a nativity scene at Christmas while singing happy birthday Jesus. The two just don't go together. Should, should not see it. And another thing that's opening a door to the enemy is when people start delving into things like Ouija boards. That's a big, big opening. Where were Ouija boards developed? They were developed by Parker Brothers. It was supposed to be a game. It's supposed to be fun, it's supposed to be like, oh, this is cute. But it's re referencing back to dark magic. By the way, where is Parker Brothers headquarters? Salem, Massachusetts. Any, any coincidence? God forbids the merging of pagan customs into our lives. You're not supposed to be merging pagan customs with your worship. Deuteronomy 12, 31, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way for every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. So you're gonna go and say, well, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna in involve this in my worship of God. I mean, you can't worship that way. God demands purity of worship from his followers, not combining paganism into Christianity. Right. You're not supposed to have any mixture. How can oil and water mix? How can light and darkness mix? God wants us to avoid darkness. Halloween is all about darkness. It emphasizes the dark characters of mythology, witches, wizards, vampires, ghosts, zombies. They're all associated with either death, Satanism, or the occult. Nothing that any child of God should partake in. Um, the whole celebration is based on a lie. It's based on the lie that people have immortal souls. We know that our spirit is eternal, but if their immortal soul can come back and roam through the earth. It's re basically the, uh, rooted in the idea of reincarnation, kind of. It's all tied together. So what does the Bible have to say about talking to the dead? You remember the story of Balaam? Let's turn over to Psalm chapter 106 real quick. Uh, Psalm 106, we'll go down to verse 28. This is talking about the Israelites when they were in the wandering through the wilderness. It says, they joined themselves also to the idol Baal of Peor and ate sacrifices offered to the lifeless. Thus, they provoked the Lord to anger with their practices and a plague broke out among them. They ate sacrifices offered to the lifeless. Right. Now, we've talked, we just talked about this recently about the sin of Balaam and how he made Israel to fall you know, he was supposed to be coming and, and prophesying something evil upon them, but he couldn't because the Lord was blessing them and who the Lord has blessed, he can't curse. But he came up with this plan that he told Balak that if you just put your beautiful women out there, they can seduce the children of Israel into idolatry by in seducing them into immorality. That, okay, you want to come be with me? Then you got to offer a sacrifice to this God. And so basically, it was like a celebration of Halloween, what it used to be. They're offering sacrifices, they're partaking in these celebrations, and they become one with that God. It says they joined themselves. It wasn't just joining these, themselves to these women. They joined themselves to that God, Baal. And Baal, we know, we know all the things that are written about Baal in there, that he was the God of death and, you know, the, the, the God of Molech. All those things right. that are tied in. Jonathan Kahn talks about the return of the gods yes. in this time. Yes, indeed. This is what's going on. I'm telling you, this is what's going on. They've been released. Talk about Samhain, that god that they summon up every Halloween. These are the returns of the gods that right. they're talking about. And uh, it really is happening now. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 2.
Revelation 2, uh, starting at verse 13, let's talk about the church of Pergamum. I know where you live, a place where Satan sits enthroned. This was a dark place. This is a place that was involved in occult stuff. Yet you are clinging to and hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed in your midst, where Satan dwells. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have some people who are clinging to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to set a trap and a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to entice them to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols and to practice lewdness. You also have some who in a similar way are clinging to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, these corruptors of the people, which things I hate. So it's the same spirit that you're talking about here. Um, let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, and we will start at verse 10. Actually, verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of these nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. Just talked about the bone fires of Halloween. Or who uses divination, or as a soothsayer, or an auger, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a medium, or a wizard, or a necromancer. That all follows, that falls under Halloween. It's right there. It covers it all. For all who do these things, all who do these things, oh. not some, all who do these things, are an abomination to the Lord, and it is because of these abominable practices that the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless and absolutely true to the Lord your God. For these nations whom you dispossess, um, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do so. Don't mess with this stuff. Don't even mess with this stuff. Let's go over to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus 18, verse 21. You shall not give any of your children to pass through the fire and sacrifice them to Molech, the fire god. Remember, this is a fire celebration that they talked about. It's the same spirit. Nor shall you profane the name of your God by giving it to false gods. I am the Lord. In verse 24, you do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, for in all these things the nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I visit the iniquity of it upon it, and the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. So shall you keep my statutes and my ordinances, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither the native-born nor any stranger who sojourns among you. So he's telling you, don't do these things. Don't have any part in it. And don't, invo- don't in, uh, include it in your worship of Yahweh. You can't take Absolutely. these practices and bring it into there. Look at Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah 32, and we'll go down to verse verse 33. And they have turned their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them persistently, yet they would not listen and receive instruction. But they set uh, set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it. How many Christians are setting abominations in the house which they're claiming is set apart to him something shouldn't be in the church house right and they built high places for worship of baal in the valley of ben hinnom to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire in worship also of and to molech which i did not command them nor did it come into my mind or heart that they should do this abomination to cause judah to sin so again Pointing to these, uh, these origins, it's the same spirit. 
You know, we were talking right. about Halloween or originating with the Celtic tradition. Well, where did they get it from? We're going to get that in a moment. We're not supposed to do things that the Gentiles are doing. 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 22 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we think, or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You're provoking him to jealousy by partaking in those two things. What do we know about talking to the dead? Ecclesiastes 9, 5 says, The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. You're not going to get anything from the dead. Again, you're not talking. People might say, well, I talked to my dead grandmother. They called her up and I talked to my dead grandmother. It's a familiar spirit. It is. It's a familiar spirit who knew her. Remember, spirits are eternal. The devil's been here since the beginning of creation. He's, he may not be stronger or more powerful or he may not even be omnipresent but he has a lot of a horde of little demons that run around and they follow people and they know exactly what they're like they know their characteristics right, they, they know how account. they are they keep an eye on it right and that's what they're they're referring to well let's tie it into what the bible says and we're gonna, this is where it's going to get interesting um, Encyclopedia Britannica states this about Halloween. It long antedates Christianity. The chief characteristics of ancient Halloween were the lighting of bonfires, the belief that one night a year during which uh, ghosts and witches are most likely to wander about. Encyclopedia Americana, likewise, says it's clearly a relic of pagan times. So anything that you look at, it's a relic of pagan times. It has nothing to do with Christianity. Um, for centuries... Christian, they, this person wrote here, let's see, Dorothy Wood of the Wichita Beacon wrote the following, actually condemning much of Christianity for plagiarizing pagan festivals. So she's upset about it. But this ancient night of revelry for the devil and his cohorts has degenerated. It's the Christians who are to blame. For centuries, they've been grabbing off of all the old heathen festivals. The midwinter feast with its greens and feasting and drinking has become Christmas. The wild spring festival has become Easter. And the worshipers of Christ boldly use the old pagan symbols of fertility, chicks and rabbits and eggs. So they're saying, they're, even pagans know that we're grabbing off of that. Now they've completely taken over Halloween. Again, notice that she said that it was, it was a um, ancient night of revelry for the devil and his cohorts. Um, Halloween, again, is nowhere mentioned in the New Testament as a Christian festival. You never see Yeshua talking about celebrating it. You never see any of the disciples talking about it. In fact, the Christian commemoration of a festival built around worship of the dead the worship of the Lord of the dead is ironic because Yeshua himself stated that God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Matthew 22, Mark 12, and Luke 20. Psalm 115, 17 says the, pray, the dead praise not the Lord. So there's nothing to that. The important question follows, which deity then is being worshipped on Halloween? First, we must briefly mention one of the most important holy festivals that is commanded in the Bible, Sukkot, just came through Sukkot. The festival, this festival described in Leviticus 23 begins on the 15th day of the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar, generally falling around the end of September or start of October on the Gregorian calendar. It's also of note that this festival was kept in the New Testament by Yeshua and the disciples. Again, you want something biblical to follow, something that's truly of Christian origin? What did Yeshua himself celebrate? Right. Uh, furthermore, uh, Zechariah prophesies that all nations in the future who refuse to keep the Feast of Tabernacles will be cursed. The Feast of Tabernacles is one of the festivals described in the Hebrew Bible. Now enter King Jeroboam. We know King Jeroboam. In the late 10th century BC, following the reign of King Solomon, a dramatic split took place in Israel's united um, monarchy due to the sins of Solomon. So he set it up. This split takes place. Ten tribes split away from Jerusalem-based throne of David. Led by Jeroboam, they established the northern kingdom of Israel. So you had Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. And so they have them split ten and two. 
Uh, two tribes remained to make up what became part of the South what became the southern kingdom of Judah. As related in 1 Kings 11, God gave Jeroboam a chance to establish himself as a righteous king over a prosperous kingdom. However, Jeroboam began to fear that the Israelites traveling to the temple in Jerusalem to worship would begin to turn away from him and his rules, so he concocted a plan. Now, where did he get this plan from? The last half of 1 Kings 12 describes a new religion established by Jeroboam with more convenient worship centers in Dan in the north and in Bethel in the south, centered around cattle worship. They always seem to go back to the calves from, the, from Egypt on. Jeroboam appointed as his priests, not the Levites, but the lowest of the people. So he made new priests. And the last two verses of this chapter describe the central feast day of his nor newly described, newly established religion. And Jeroboam ordered a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month likened to the feast that is in Judah, and he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he made in Bethel the 15th day of the month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. We've just entered into the eighth month, which is Keshvan. The eighth month is Keshvan. So it's during the month of Keshvan, on the 15th of Keshvan, he set up these altars of worship. It's proclaimed his feast day on oh, yeah. this day. Jeroboam then established a counterfeit feast day exactly one month after the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. This feast, therefore, <laughs> relates to the end of October, early November, exactly the time frame as the original Celtic Samhain uh, celebrations. Furthermore, the Israelites calculated their days and festivals from sunset to sunset. So when the night began, they started celebrating. Isn't that interesting? Both Samhain and Jeroboam's feasts occurred at the same time of year. Both were the chiefest festivals of their respective religions. Both were reckoned from evening to evening. Both were central to the cattle cult. The Samhain, the Celts, the Celts in the Samhain tradition um, were worshiping the cattle. That's why they sacrificed the cattle. They brought the cows down for the pasture in the summer. And so they sacrificed them when they were returning them to the mountains. Both included related burning and sacrifices, and both had magic and witchcraft as central to their religions. From this point forward, the religion and customs of the northern kingdom of Israel became known as the sin of Jeroboam. You see that throughout the Bible. Featuring witches and wizards using divination and enchantment. It's, it's inseparable from it. Way back then. Way back then. <laughs> This was the result of Jeroboam's installation of the lowest people as priests. There were the, literally, the Hebrew word translated lowest is literally edges or extremities. These new religious leaders were the extremities of the people. They were out on the edges somewhere. Uh, there's even a potential biblical connection here with the re-emerging of the dead. As Jeroboam was worshiping at his altar in Bethel, a prophet of God arrived warning the king that for these sins, a future leader named Josiah would come on the scene and open the graves of Jeroboam's pagan priests, exhuming the bodies and burning them to ashes on the altar. This prophecy led to a general fear among Jeroboam's priests, one of which hatched a crafty plan to try to preserve his remains in state. Uh, 300 years later, the prophecy was fulfilled and a king named Josiah was coronated. He sum summarily exhumed and burned the bones of the dead priests. It is therefore interesting the great lengths are taken to the Halloween Samhain festivals to appease the emerging dead as well as witches and wizards. Amazing. But all of this is simply the tip of the iceberg in the deep connection between the early Israelite pagan priests and the later emerging class of Celtic Druids in Europe. You know, there's a lot of people who talk about the lost ten tribes that they scattered to the world. <clears throat> The tribe of Dan 
is an interesting connection with it. The tribe of Dan has a language and a migratory link and very much similar with their customs and their, their rituals. That they trace back, they trace the, oh, I just skipped it. Tribe of Dan is the root of the modern day nation of Ireland. That's where the Celts came from. Uh, they, even in the hair color, the, the tribe of Dan was known for red hair and they passed it on to, where is Ireland known for? Um, but when you look at the two uh, comparisons between them, they both carry that witchcraft spirit. Why is it that the ancient Celts had that in their, in their center? Because Jeroboam opened up way back in their history, a door. We talk about familiar spirits, talk about things that are passed down from generation to generation. The sins of Jeroboam were passed down from generation to generation. But one of Jeroboam's calves was set up in Dan. And part of the, part of the Celts, they called themselves the Tutha de Danan, the tribe of Dan. Dan. That's, right. That's where they came from. Um, at the times, Israel, the kings of Israel, the tribes of Israel split into two nations. King Jeroboam adopted the feast of the, in place of the biblical feast of tabernacles, a pagan celebration in the middle of the eighth month, the year used to begin in the spring of the year, and the eighth month extended from the middle of October to the middle of November. Right. And the middle of the month corresponded to the very time of Halloween today. In fact, October means the eighth month in Latin. Since the days of Jeroboam, the ten tribes of Israel, who later migrated into northwest Europe, have continued to celebrate this pagan harvest festival, which today is called Halloween. Because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives out the Canaanites before them. The religion of Israel began with a man, Jeroboam, who changed the true worship of God. He established a feast in the eighth month to replace the true Feast of Tabernacles. He may have replaced the Sabbath with Sunday worship. There's something to indicate that in there. He replaced the Levitical priesthood with men of his own choosing, and he replaced God with the golden calves. And as for the very festival and the sins of Jeroboam, God explains that the entire northern kingdom of Israel was utterly conquered and driven out. And this is all during this month of Keshvan. The, see the connection? See the tie? It's coming from the ancient times with his sins right. that he set up there, door with leading open. them astray. He open. opened a door. And now that door has been opened to the demonic realm on that day ever since. It was never a day that Yahweh picked. It was never one of his appointed days. He never marked this day and said, this is the day in which I want you to worship me and have this feast. It was never part of it. Um, the, the prophet Jeremiah says to learn not the ways of the heathen. Jer uh, Deuteronomy 12 says, be not ensnared into following them that you might not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. You shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Don't be doing that. God clearly spelled out his own holy days for his people to follow as a statute forever. Halloween is clearly not one of those. It is clearly a festival in which horror and violence, pretend or real, is indulged. Yet the Bible says that the wicked and him that loves violence, his soul hates. If you love violence, you know, love all that gory stuff. <laughs> Another um, thing is that... Um, People believe in the Christian world that, okay, well, I'm going to dress up, and as that, I'm just mo making a mockery of the devil. I'm going to make, a, make, you know, show him that we really are, are conquering him. But Proverbs 14.9 says, fools make a mock at sin. Fools make a mock at sin. You have to really stretch it to say that there's any reason Christians should be celebrating. When it was one of the things we saw, Sherry, that had said that um, it was because, of the, because Yeshua... Yeshua had conquered death on the cross, so we celebrate this holiday, and all the blood and gore is because the cross was a very bloody place. So we remember Yeshua and all the blood on the cross when we're celebrating Halloween. That's stretching it. <laughs> His blood has redeemed us. His blood has redeemed this day. Yeah. 
Yeshua's blood has redeemed this day and it's taken it back for him. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. Yeah. Halloween is a festival of horror and darkness. Look around. Just look around. <laughs> Just look around. Huh? The Bible repeatedly describes God as a God of light and living. Woe unto them who call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Um, God's holy days are a symbol of light. But God says, what partnership can, ha can righteousness have with wickedness? Can light associate with darkness? Can Christ agree with the devil? Can there be a compact between the temple of God and idols? And the temple of the living God is what we are. Right. So we got to be very watchful what we're getting into and what we're opening up in the side of the darkness. Because it is realer that people, than people think. It is far realer than people think. It's gotten really dark out there. Really dark. It's like Jordan was just saying about how we have entered into the eighth month. <clears throat> this month is a month of continuation. And it's also a month to to take the time, to take the inspiration and in what we have gained and what we've been hearing so far. Through all these feasts. Through all these feasts, through all these Sabbaths, and then today, and integrate it into our, into our life. So <clears throat> we're going to go flip to a, 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 a happier switch of this. And on the positive. And, and, um, but we're just going to take a brief look at the Torah portion for today and, and look at the darkness of the days of old. And right. then at the darkness of the days of today that today. we've been talking right. about. You know, Jordan was ta talking about, you know, the, how bad things have gotten and going into places and stuff in this time. You know, it, and, and just to share a little something. Yes, yeah, so you, you share. You know, yeah. <laughs> so just to share. Slide around everything <laughs> in the name of Yeshua. Just to share a little something. You know, for us, Anyways, we're so programmed. I'm so programmed. Most of us are so programmed. We don't even think Halloween. It's not even a part of who we are. It's, there's nothing about it. You know, it's, it's not a thought. It's not, it's just not. It's not a not, temptation. It's, it's, it's not a temptation. <laughs> it's just not anything, you know. But you still have to be on guard and aware yeah. of the time that you're in Absolutely. to make sure you're not caught off guard. Mm -hmm. That's why when, it says that to be watchful, be on your guard, for your adversary the devil roams about like a lion. He's roaming about out there. Right. You've got to be on your guard so he and, can't steal from you. And the enemy knows, you know, come on, he knows all of our pasts. Right. He knows what we were involved in. He knows what our families did and stuff like that. And he'll try to take the opportunity to use that. If, you, if, if, if you're in a place where you were caught off guard with something, and, you know, like I said, we're not programmed to that. So it's not even in our thinking. And it's amazing. It was amazing to me, you know, this experience that Jordan and I had Thursday night. Now, I was raised, my family were big into Halloween. We trick-or-treated every single year. My parents dressed us up in all these little, my sisters and I, in all these little costumes. And we went trick-or-treating every year. And, you know, then my mother had her little you know, happy thing that she used to do and have us sit with popcorn and watch things, you know, really no child really should have watched at, at early ages, you know, and, and nothing towards my mother. You know, my mom didn't know, didn't know. better. She didn't know. She, she, didn't, she didn't know. She didn't know any better. You know, that's how she was raised. That's the family she married into. And um, so, you know, being a child and, and growing up in the, the trick-or-treating and the Halloween and, and, then, and then having a family that delved into things, that had horror a movies. past in the dark side, mm -hmm. that delved into Seances. horror movies and seances. Ouija boards was a common thing for my sister and I, you know, and, and, and things that my family were into. And, and to honestly say, having that experiences of knowing how real this stuff is to have experienced and, and seen actual manifestations of things all throughout my childhood, right. all throughout my childhood, every right. house we lived in, all throughout, <laughs> all different things. You know, Jordan talking about stuff of, of doors opening and closing and, you know, stuff. 
you know, dark side it's is real. really, really it's real. It's real. And, and, and actually seeing things, seeing forms, and, and just, you know, it's real. Always dark. And always, always, always dark. Always dark forms. Always dark. And it's interesting, even in the midst of that, you know, as much awfulness as it was, and as much fear that it created, the darkness always pulls. Yep. And it was this enticing, and it was this pull, it. it was this draw. And it's like, and you would think you would want the exact opposite, to turn around and run as far away from it as you possibly could, you know? So, um, but that's yeah, it Disney, always has That's why pull. Disney focuses so much on that. And this, this, right. uh, I saw Sid and Roth, had, getting darker. Sid Roth mm -hmm. had this, um, this uh, <laughs> ex warlock on there, and they were talking about the new movie that came out recently, Hocus Pocus 2 and how demonic it is, but how they try to make it seem like, oh, it's something to laugh about, and it's something to, oh, you just play around with it. Right. What is that giving into children's lives right. that is going to open them up to these things? Like the frog in the little petri dish, yeah. slowly, yeah. slowly heating heat them up. up the water yeah, until they don't they're realize in they too don't far. Jump out. Yeah. So, so having that experience and growing up in a family that was into a lot of things, and it's like, even as far as, you know, I was telling, I think I was telling mom yesterday, you know, Christmas time there was Santa, and Easter time there was the Easter bunny. And I don't even know where they got this idea from, but my parents and our family, you know, come Halloween, there was a Halloween witch. And so the Halloween witch visited our house every Halloween night while my sisters and I were out trick-or-treating and we'd be out trick-or-treating, we would come home and the Halloween witch would have visited. And each one of us had our bag of goodies that the Halloween witch left us. And, you know, my sisters and I always baked the witch cookies, you know, kind of like what you did for Santa. I always baked the witch cookies and left her her drink and, you know, the cookies would be gone and the drink would be gone. You know, my father would indulge himself, obviously, because there was no Halloween witch. But there but was in the something realm, there in the was. spirit realm there was. No, but and that's exactly tapping back into what we were talking about, the ancient festival of Samhain. Mm -hmm. right. They would put out these cakes and these goodies for mm -hmm. the spirits to come in and partake. Right. And spirits came in and partook, oh, trust yes. me. <laughs> but, you know, it was like, and, and, and being little, you know, we, I thought Santa was real for the longest time. I thought the Easter Bunny was real for the longest time. I thought the Halloween witch was real for the longest time. So, you know, all these things being created and stuff. So, Jordan and I had the experience on Thursday night. We had, um, we had gone out because we needed to get supplies for the church and stuff and needed to get things for Thanksgiving. And so we were going to go to BJ's and the party store and stuff. So we decided to go to the party store first. We figured, all right, party store first and then go to BJ's. <laughs> You know, just not thinking. We don't not, think. Not you didn't think. That's you know, right. we just I don't, mean, think don't think Halloween. Don't think Halloween. Yep. But, you know, in all honesty, you know, and, 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 and on me, you know, now I know. Because I'm so programmed. This month of October, I don't take my child anywhere. My child does not enter a store. Because I know what the month is. Well, why didn't I think of that for myself? Especially with the background that I've had. I would so much protect my daughter to make sure I have to protect her more so maybe than some people have to because of the family I came from and because familiar yes. spirits familiar are real. Spirits, that's and right. they have tried to track forces. and track and track. And I have more so have to protect her so much. But not just that, but also for the fact of I will not, I refuse to have my daughter go through what I went through as a little girl. And all the fear and everything that lasted, all, it, it, it's still surfaces every once yep. in a while. But I refuse to have my daughter have those experiences. She will not have those experiences. So, you know, here we go, and we go to go to the party store, and I commented to Jordan, the parking lot was packed. Mm -hmm. It was packed. We had a hard time finding a parking space. We had to park. There. And I said to Jordan, why, dawn is, on you. why is the parking lot so full? It's Thursday night. <laughs> it didn't even dawn on us. Hallelujah. You know, right? So we get out of the car and walk across the parking lot and go through the first set of doors. And we're just talking and stuff. And then go through the second set of doors. I don't know how many of you have been to the party store. But you walk in and it's like just this huge like foyer, I guess they call it or whatever. And we walked in and it wasn't maybe 10 feet into the store. And it was, I said to mom, I said, I don't know the word to describe it, but it being awful. 
It was the most awful experience that I have had. It was demonic. And it was demonic. It was demonic. It was and awful. There was a spirit it in was that demonic. Store. I have not had that type of experience or that been in that type of atmosphere for years. It was like walking, you know, and when I was a little girl, things were different. We dressed up as princesses. Well, I didn't, just making that clear. I didn't dress up as a princess. We dressed up as princesses, my sister did, and, and police officers or Bugs Bunny or whatever, you know? Innocent things. And innocent, innocent things. things. Supposedly okay, innocent, supposedly innocent right? things. I have to say that There's I no was, innocent things there. there was no innocent thing in the store. I have to say I was, not one. I was caught off guard. I was shocked. And we walked in and it was like, I mean, I've been in haunted houses and it was, it's like a haunted house. it was like walking into a haunted house. It was like a combination of a haunted house and a horror movie. And it wasn't right. just, I mean, in hundreds of costumes, hundreds of costumes. All evil. Halloween decorations, but the displays, they had these life-like displays, full figured things that moved and it made came noises. After you when you walked and, by. and when you walked by, it triggered them and they came after you like this. And things hanging on the wall, one particular thing hanging on the wall. I was like, that's a good place for him. But I mean, just blood coming out of his mouth and his Fangs and teeth. And, I mean, it was awful. It was, awful. It was awful. And the sounds, and you could feel it. You could feel the Absolutely. thickness. You could feel it in the store. And, you know, and I said to mom, kind of jokingly, but kind of seriously, it was like, tragic for me because being caught off guard, it, it was traumatic. Yeah. Being it caught off traumatic. guard, it was traumatic. As an adult. Right, as an but adult. But now tell them who else but, was yes. in that store. But so the more <laughs> traumatic thing is, there we like are, and there's mothers all over the place with little, little children. children. I mean, there was one a baby. She must have been 15, 16 months old, sitting in the cart, surrounded with this, I mean, this demonic there's sights and death. sounds. And 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 there was a little four-year-old I saw who had walked up to one of these displays and was just standing there like this, just looking at it, and I'm thinking, what is this imprinting what imprint on is this going child? On. That's right. What is going on inside and that what child? what doors are opening, okay? Doors in the spirit. At such a young age. And I, th I thought, you know, like, we were walking through the store, and that's the first thing I noticed, and I think I commented to Joy, look at all these mothers in here with these children, and these little, little children. And I'm thinking, you know, it flashed me back to when I was a little girl, and it was like, and walking into this place, it, it like, reopened some things for me, and, and I had to deal with some things when we got home. But it was like seeing these parents in these stores with these children. And it was just awful. And I know, happened to know one of the employees that works there. And, um, and he had made a comment to Jordan and I. He's like, yeah, this is like our Christmas. This is our Christmas. But I said, I, afterwards, I was like, how can he wa work in that place? How could you work in that place? But my thought was, these innocent children, these innocent children, they, and some of them so young, they're so impressionable. I know what I've had to go through being exposed to stuff like that. And now what these children are gonna probably go through right. being exposed to stuff like that. But after, it was so, it was just so bad. It was so demonic. It was, like I said, I was, caught off guard because I was not expecting that. I was not expect, I know things have gotten bad. I know things have gotten dark and demonic. I know that, but it was beyond. It, it was just absolutely beyond. And, you know, and, you know, for myself, it was and like- turned around and left. And, and I had that Could've thought. turned around and left. I had that thought as soon as we walked in, I had this thought, Jordan and I need to get out of this store. And, or whatever at least reason, be the blood and whatever reason, in tongues and yeah. <laughs> releasing. Whatever reason, I overrode the thought, and 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 it wasn't good to have overrode that thought because, like I said, I had to deal with some things afterwards. But it was like, it was so bad, it's just so dark and awful, and just like, and I thought, who is the person who ever even conceived the ideas of some of the dis displays that was, I mean. One in particular that Jordan and I walked by, 
was, I don't even know what she was. I mean, she was some woman's, I don't know what she was, chained, sitting in a chair, shaking, shaking with her head down, yeah. making this moaning noise, but as you walked forward, she rocked real quick at you. And it was just, I mean, it was just bad. It was, but, and my insides were going off the entire time. I mean, going off the entire time. Like, even as I'm talking about it now, it's like, it's just like, but it's so bad out there. And this is what, and this was just the, uh, uh, an innocent store in, in, in Lemonster. Supposedly. You know, supposedly. supposedly an innocent store in Lemonster. Uh, and we were just going anymore. in there to get Thanksgiving stuff, okay? It was like just going in. And interestingly, because, you know, here's this huge section of, of Halloween stuff. And then here's in the back part of the store was their big thing of starting to do their Christmas stuff. And in the back, the individual that we know had come over to help us. And, oh, what are you guys looking for? And it's like Thanksgiving stuff. And, and it's a little tiny Thanksgiving thing in the stand. back corner of the store. And it's like, that is just wrong. Because, you know, not to get off into it, but what is Thanksgiving about? Mm -hmm. You know, what is Thanksgiving about? It's about giving thanks to Yahweh for right. how good he is and everything he's done. But then here it is, you've got the devil as you're walking through a store and, and everything about him influencing people. You know, and it was just, it was, it was just, okay. it, was, it was shocking, but it was a, it was a, le yeah. It was, a, it was a lesson learned about, you know, just keep your guard at all times. You know, yep. kind of be expecting stuff like that. Not that you want to right. be thinking that and stuff, but be aware of the time. You know, releasing be aware of where you, you need are. To be releasing the glory you know, in yeah, a place like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, we need to go is. and we need to walk around that place yeah. and just release things. Yeah. You it's know, true. Just to break the darkness. It's true. Okay, because greater is he that's in us exactly. than he that's in the world. Exactly. Because okay? how many what people... we have to learn to exercise. How many people have gone in and out of that store for the last couple of weeks? And they've changed. Once just, they go in, they're different when right. they come out. And I can just imagine right. how many people are in that right. store like right now. They walk now. into yeah. a mud okay. puddle right. and they walk out. But how many, how many parents and their children are in that store today? Right. We're only a couple days before Halloween. Today and tomorrow. And it's just like, and you know, in how many people open doors this weekend that they don't even know they're opening? How many people open doors that the set future. them up it's for cool. the future and open portals to darkness that are in their life? And then they wonder why things are not going right. Wonder why they're having issues with their children. Really got to stand know, guard. We what need did to stand you, guard. What did uh, Yahweh say through Samuel to Saul? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Both are sins. Rebellion ends up leading to witchcraft. Where did Saul end up at the end of his life? Right. He went and consulted a medium to bring up the spirit of Samuel. So how far did he go in his rebellion? They're tied together. Where did he go to the witch of Endor? He went to the witch of Endor. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. But the, the, the connection between that, so you start seeing more... Um, violent crimes, more rebellious acts during this wonder? time? Is it any wonder you're delving into the, the dark side? Is it any wonder? You know, I said to mom a few days ago, and, I, and I've always known this to be a, a thing, a fact, but I've never actually seen a bulletin put out about it or alert to be put out about it. But it was like two or three weeks ago, it was on the news and places were, were releasing this thing, uh, telling people, pet owners, pet owners, Anybody that owns a black cat, keep them in the house during the month of October. Yep. Now, we know black cats are one of the things for Halloween, okay? Yep. But they actually, people, the news, whatever, actually a warning, released a time. warning to How pet owners. Going. Do not allow, if you own a black cat, do not allow them out of your house. Keep them in the, within the house. Jordan was talking about ac animal sacrifices. What do you think takes place on Halloween night in this city? It used to, and we uh, live you, in an yeah, area. We, okay. we took it over, though. We, we live in an over. area. Remember where, when Mary Fran came yes. and she looked right over that way? Yes. Yes. She okay. pointed that way yes. and said that there was a witch's coven yes. that has uh, an, a, an, an assignment, an assignment against, against us. Because yes. yes. they didn't like us. Because yes. they didn't like us. Ha -ha. But there, we there would were, conquer them. There were active things that actually happened up out there in our area in our, where, in our where, neighborhood. where we live right now there were demonic things that they don't took live place there anymore. Not, not anymore, anymore. <laughs> not they got anymore. evicted they got okay? evicted but 
People in the world know this is true, mm -hmm. okay? For a worldly place to release a warning, protect your black cats, mm -hmm. okay? And what is the matter with Christians, okay? What is, just saying, just saying. So. Yeah, why would we have any part in it? So let's go to the Torah portion for today. Yes, And it's indeed. in Genesis 6. Genesis Hallelujah. 6 verse, starts at verse 9, but we're actually going to start, well, Jordan kind of mentioned a little bit of this. We're going to start at verse 1. And you know, we're going to, like I said, we're going to look at the darkness in, in the days of old and, and the comparison to we are seeing exactly yep. what's going Yeshua on now. said it was going to be. But, it's going to be as in the days of Noah. But we're going to end because there's always light in the midst of That's darkness. That's right. That's okay? right. Okay? There's That's always right. light in the midst of darkness. So, we're in the ark. We're not in, in the dark. Yes, we're in the ark. So Genesis 6, starting at verse 1, says, When men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair, and they took wives of all they desired and chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not forever dwell and strive with man, for he also is flesh, but his days shall yet be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God lived with the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who are of old, men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination and intention of all human thinking was only evil continually. And the Lord... I just wanted to say real quick, this whole passage here, and we're not going to get too much into it today, but um, they're the sons of God refers to a, a, the fallen angels right. that happened after Nephilim. Satan fell. The Nephilim. You hear the Nephilim? And the, the, when it says that they were marrying and given mar giving in marriage, they were, they were taking of all they desired. This is a mixed marriage that wasn't supposed to happen right. between literally <laughs> angels and fallen people. Angels. Fallen angels and people. It's demonic And they create, create the Nephilim from which came Goliath. And you see this, <clears throat> this generation, this seed of the Nephilim that happens. And it says that in the end times, there's going to be a return of that. Right, you know, return it says, of the gods. <laughs> when it says that in the end time it's going to be like the days of Noah, marrying and giving in marriage, it's a direct reference back to this. It's not just talking about people normally marrying, oh, this person's marrying this person. No, it's, it's talking about the return of the gods, quite literally, right. that right. there's going to be these mixed things going on. Right. But verse 6, <clears throat> And the Lord regretted <clears throat> that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved at heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy, blot out, and wipe away mankind, whom I have created from the face of the ground, not only man, but the beasts and the creeping things and the birds of the air, for it grieves me and makes me regretful that I have made them. But Noah found, fa found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the history of the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and righteous man, blameless <coughs> in his generation. Noah walked in habitual fellowship with Yahweh. Um, when it says Noah was, uh, uh, was blameless in his generation, another translation says perfect, it was because he was not of the seed That's of the right. Nephilim. That's right, he wasn't contaminated He wasn't contaminated the by the seed of the Nephilim. Yahweh the had to one. preserve a seed for the one Messiah to come Messiah. through. That's, That's right. why the flood had to happen. He's the only he was one preserving it. He was the only one that had the, the pure seed in him. <clears throat> Right. Verse 10, And Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. The earth was depraved and putrid in God's sight. Mm. That's how it is today. That's how it is today. Okay, that's how it is today. And the land was filled with violence, des desecration, infringement, outrage, assault, and lust for power. And God looked upon the world and saw how degenerate, debased, and vicious it was. For all humanity had corrupted their way upon the earth and lost their true, true direction. Hallelujah. God said to Noah, I intend to make an end of all flesh. For through men the land is filled with violence. And behold, I will destroy them and the land. Make yourself an ark of gof of of gopher or cypress wood. Make in it rooms and cover it inside and out with pitch. And he goes on to say how big to make it and stuff. Go down to verse 17. For behold, I, even I, will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy and make putrid all flesh under the heavens in which are the breath and spirit of life. Everything that is on the land shall die. But I will establish my covenant 
promise, pledge with you, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And, every, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Male and female. Male and female. <laughs> male and female. <laughs> male and female. Of fowls and birds according to their kinds, of beasts according to their kinds, of every creeping thing, now, it does not say every creep, okay? It says every creeping thing. Just saying, he said to keep creeps out of it. That's of every right. creeping We've got thing. Authority over every creeping thing. <laughs> of every creeping every creep. thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come in with you that they may be kept alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten, and you shall collect and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Okay, Noah was a righteous man. He did all that God commanded him. Just one, just a little rabbit trail I wanted to go off on for a second. But on verse 18, when he said, but I will establish my covenant with you. Mm -hmm. Well, if you jump to Genesis chapter nine, right. and you look at verse 15, we're just gonna set some things straight here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will earnestly remember my covenant, or solemn, verse, chapter nine, verse 15. I will earnestly remember my covenant or solemn pledge, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters will no more become a flood to destroy and make all flesh corrupt. Verse 16. Yes, if indeed. you want to know the truth about something, look Try at the Bible. Look at the word. Okay, look That's at the right. word. Verse 16, when the rainbow is in the clouds and I look upon it, I will earnestly remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And, Noah, and God said to Noah, this rainbow, right, this rainbow that God created, Okay, this rainbow that he set into place is the token or sign of the covenant or solemn pledge which I've established between me and all flesh upon the earth. If you need to know what the rainbow about is about, that is where it stands. They've, okay? even, they've even altered the colors of the rainbow. They've anyway. altered the colors they've of the rainbow. So yes. It signifies their exactly. many different Okay, This is a good example right here where the enemy has taken something of Yahweh and he's right. twisted it. Yep. He turned into something wicked. The rainbow does not belong to the devil. It does not. Okay? And it does not belong to those that follow the devil's ways. Boy, it is not. Yahweh's. Yes, it is. It is, belongs to Yahweh. Always was, always will always be. Always was, always is, always will be. Just have to go off on that little thing Alleluia. for a second. So now we read about the darkness in, in the, the Torah portion for today. Now let's go to Luke 17, which is the Brit Hadashah reading. So Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 20. Asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he replied to them, Yeshua replied to them by saying, the kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed or with visible display, nor will people say, look, here it is, or see, it is, it is there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you, in your hearts and among you, surrounding you. And he said to the disciples, the time is coming when you will long to see even one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look, he is there, or look, he is here, but do not go out or follow them. For like the lightning that flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his own day. But first he must suffer many things and be disapproved and repudiated and rejected by this age and generation. And just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the time of the Son of Man. People ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage, right up to the day when Noah went into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So also it was the same as it was in the days of Lot. People ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the very day that Lot went out of Sodom, it right. rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That is the way it will be on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. And we are just about at that day. Okay, these are the days that we're, this, he's talking about now. Okay, this is now. On that day, let him who is 
on the housetop with his belongings in the house, not come down and go inside to carry them away. And likewise, let him who is in the field not turn back. Verse 32, remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will preserve and quicken it. I'll end there. The the portion only went to verse 27, but I wanted to add that few things in there. Because you know what? We are in the days of Lot. It is like being in Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, just the wickedness that's going on. But like I said, in the midst of darkness, there is light. Yes, there is. So just real quickly, we're going to go back to what we read last week in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines on in the darkness, for the darkness has never overpowered it, put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it, and is unreceptive to it. Verse 9, there it was, the true light was then coming into the world, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light that illumines every person. I just wanted to read it out a couple other translations. Actually, no, not yet. I'm going to wait. So, light. Yeshua was the light of men. He was the light that came into this world. He was the light. He is the light in the midst of darkness. So, what is light? Light stimulates sight and it makes things visible. Light represents what is good, true, and holy. Darkness represents what is evil and false. All this Halloween stuff is evil and it's false. It it's is. deceiving. Yes, it is. Satan's goal was def- to Satan's goal was to defeat Yeshua, but light defeated him. The Greek word for light is phos, which means any and every form of light. Yahweh is light. His light has an extremely pure, brilliant quality. Right. But the Hebrew word for light is or. or. So we're going to take a little study on the word or here before we end, okay? Now, like Jordan has said and stuff, you get into the Hebrew of the words, and it gives you a whole, you know, you could read verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the or of men. Right. Just even just saying it, okay, See, saying the Hebrew part of it just brings to life, That's right. okay, the word, and brings to life what is inside of us. So the word light means illumination or an agent that makes something visible. In the Bible, light appears more than 230 times. It is first seen at the very beginning in Genesis 1-3, where it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, let there be or, and there was or. In Hebrew, the word or means something more. Now, we just read the Torah portion in Noah, and we just read what, is in, in what Luke said about the same thing. It or also means giving order to something chaotic. Right. We are in chaotic times. There's a lot of chaos going on in this world. The previous verse stated that the earth was formless and empty, or in other words, chaotic. So when God declared, let there be light, He did not only mean illumination, he also meant it to bring order to an already chaotic earth. Right. This is quite understandable since the Bible describes God as the God of order, and in his kingdom, order is manifested and established. Later on in the story, Yeshua came and revealed himself as the light of the world. John 8, 12 says, Again, Yeshua spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So there's life in light. There's death in darkness. There's nothing light about Halloween. Okay, Halloween is dark. And the reality of it is there's death in Halloween. That's right. That's there's what Halloween is it. about. This is, there's chaos in it. As the light, Yeshua now challenges believers to do the same. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. Right. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We are to be the light that shines in the dark, providing brilliance to people in need, just like people going in and out of that store. Moreover, we don't just shine, we also set things in order, especially for the people with chaotic lives. 
we are walking oars, okay? And we gotta right. get into us that as we're walking, that light inside of us, Yeshua inside of us, is, is actually, it's manifesting out of us. And it's anything that's in disorder around us has right. no choice. The reality is, the truth is, it has no choice but right. to get into order. And take authority and, over that and to chaos. To get into order. You know, we, we, we have certain confessions that we do where we call things into divine order. We call right. things back to Eden right. status. Absolutely. Okay, you did not see this stuff that's going on today back in the Garden of Eden before the fall. All right, and we call things back into Eden status. Right. So the, like I just said, the first time we see or used was in Genesis 1-3 when God said, let there be light, and there was light. So what is this light or? It is the very <laughs> essence of Yahweh himself. Yes. And you see it spelled out in the word or. When you take those two Hebrew letters, it spells out Yahweh, it spells out Yeshua, and then it connects them together. And then when it connects them together, it gives you shalom. Right. And what is shalom? shalom? Nothing missing, nothing broken. Wholeness, life and wholeness. And authority completion. over the chaos of and darkness. And it's authority over the chaos of darkness. It is the very life force of Yeshua himself. And that life force is what whole, Jordan was in talking about it last week. It holds all it's creation everything. together. Everything is it, light everything, energy. Everything. everything is. It holds all creation together. And it gives us, his creation, the ability to be in harmony with him, but to cause heart, things to come into harmony That's right. as we go about. Mom, right. what does mom talk about? Leave tracks of light. Leave tracks of right. ore. Leave tangible. tracks. They are tangible, tangible things in this Tracks realm. of divine order. Bringing that things from a chaotic state back into order. the divine That's order right. of Yahweh. Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 18. There's a few light scriptures. Well, not light scriptures like light. They're heavy, but they're <laughs> okay. But interesting, okay? Interesting when you see... How the word is talking about a certain topic and he brings the light into it. And so, like now, Christians have no business participating in Halloween. In darkness. None. Darkness whatsoever. You know, you have no business associating with darkness, being around that. And it's not that. even subtle. And it's, it's not. It's, it's not subtle, subtle anymore. anymore. The devil it's, doesn't it's care dark anymore. Or light. He's just, it, there's no gray. Have anymore. at it, okay? Things are being done in public now that. Right. You know, we would not have seen 20, 30, maybe not even 10 wouldn't years even ago. Talk about you wouldn't even talk <laughs> about it. I mean, my grandparents were alive today. They would be horrified of some of the things that take place now. So 2 Corinthians in 6, chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, this is the message. It says, don't become partners with those who reject God. We know this, the, we know this verse in the Amplified is, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's right. Okay. Don't become partners with those who reject God. How can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? Yeah. That's not partnership. That's war. Mm -hmm. Now, I like it the way the message says that. That's war. Think about, a time a war when, think about a time when, uh, been there, done that, so I can say this. A time when you unequally yoked yourself with an individual and what happened in your life, okay? War broke loose. Okay, right. all hell literally broke Absolutely. loose. Okay, war was created in your life. Is light best friends with dark? Does Yeshua go strolling with the devil? Do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in Yahweh's holy temple? But that is exactly what we are. Each right. of us, a temple in whom God lives. Yahweh put himself put it this way. I'll live in them, move into them. I will be their God and they'll be my people. So leave the corruption and compromise. Leave it for good, says Absolutely. Yahweh. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. I'll be a father to you. You'll be my sons and daughters to me. The word of the master God. All right? You know, it's a, it's a paraphrase. But there's some powerful things that it right. captures in that paraphrase. Absolutely. Second Corinthians 6.14 
in the NIV says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? The voice says, don't develop partnerships with those who are not followers of Yeshua's teachings. For what real connection can exist between righteousness and rebellion? Right. How can light participate in darkness? So back Hallelujah. to the word or. So the word or actually has two meanings to it. It has a divine meaning and it has a natural meaning. Um, in the Bible, light is often used metaphorically for life. Life, salvation, the commandments, and the divine presence of Yahweh. Yahweh, like I just said before, in his first creative act, he saw that the light was good. Okay, that's what light is. Light is good. Light is divinely rich and represents mental, moral, and spiritual life. It is also synonymous with believers and unbelievers, and the Bible does not entertain the notion that darkness can match the light of Yahweh. Oh, As a heavenly not. father, Yahweh is the only one who can bring all things into being. In the Bible, light occurs in every phase of its existence, in the sun, the moon, the stars, in us. Okay, in us. Yourself. The word or in Hebrew is related to vav, the connection between two things. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is often called, in the Old Testament, Yahweh is called the light of life. Light symbolizes life and goodness, while darkness signifies judgment, death, and the anti-God. Right. Okay? That's what we're talking about. It represents the anti-God. Right. It is Yahweh's word that makes the world visible and livable. This phrase also refers to the commandments of the Torah and the way of life. Yahweh is the father of lights. The name of Yahweh being the father of lights in Hebrew is a phrase that is reminiscent of the English phrase, the Lord of light. This term refers to Yahweh as the creator of all light and he dwells in that light. Light is the symbol of good and darkness represents evil. The phrase demonstrates that light is of utmost importance to the creation of the universe. Throughout the Bible, Yahweh is referred to as the father of light. So he is the creator of the stars and of the sun and of all things that we see in existence. Amen. Now think of it, light. This earth would not be able to survive if there was not light. Right. You know, Jordan has sent me this thing yesterday, I think it was. You know, there's different parts of the world that go into darkness for long periods right. of time. Mm -hmm. So in Norway right now, they have entered their phase, phase of the polar night. They won't night. see the sun until February. They won't see the sun until February. Until February. Now, in places That's that do that, Norway and Alaska, where there's like six months, I think, of dark or something like that, or something that happens in Alaska, further, further up with Alaska. In areas like that, where people are succumbed to darkness for a large amount of times, you see the rates of things increase. That's right. Depression, Depression suicide, suicide, drinking, think of drinking drugs. Yep. You yep. see all this demonic stuff, all this sin increase in places right. like that because we were created as lights we need that light that light is what is life right. and the dark is what is death so the word light has a rich meaning in the bible the word or it symbolizes holiness and goodness Yahweh is associated with light, and it speaks of this goodness and truth. The New Testament echoes these themes, and Yahweh is described as a marvelous light who cannot be approached. Yes, indeed. The light, in other words, is a symbol of the risen Savior. Now, an, an interesting, and another thing when I was researching, or when you go into another part of it and talking about the light of Yahweh, another phase that came into it was his, I know I'm not gonna say it right because I had a cat that was named this, so it was his Shekinah glory. Right. It's the Shekinah glory That's of right. Yahweh. That's exactly You know, the or of Yahweh. So a couple, uh, a couple more uh, scriptures. In 1 John 1, 5 in the voice it says, what are we telling you now is the very message we heard from him. Yahweh is pure light undimmed by darkness of any kind. Darkness cannot overcome light. No matter how much it tries, no matter how hard it tries, darkness will never overcome light. Never, it, it can't. You know, you walk into a dark room, we walk into here in the morning and it's dark 
And what happens? You turn the light on, and instantaneously, I mean, light travels, what is it, 186,000 miles a second or something like that? Is it a light year or whatever? Right. Okay, this room sat dark all night long, sat dark for hours. A flip of a switch, an instant light right. brightened up this entire place. Instant light, okay? Right. There's lighting here. Even if we were to shut the lights off, the light from outside would still be in this place. It cannot be overcome by the dark. But as long as okay? the switch is on, darkness cannot. As long as the switch is on, shut darkness out the light. cannot shut it, it off. Now it's you on. can switch your switch off, and if you switch your switch off, darkness can overcome. Right. Okay. But darkness does not ever overcome the power of light. Right. 1 John 1, 5 in the message says, this in essence is the message we heard from Yeshua and are passing on to you. Yahweh is light, pure light. There's not a trace of darkness in him. Yes, indeed. The complete Jewish says, and this is the message which we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Yahweh is light and there is no darkness in him, none. There is none. He is absolute even a light. Turning. Absolute light. So I'm just going to read this real quick. Um, Glory to God. It's an interesting thing, you know, because John was the, 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 the disciple that was writing about in the beginning was the word, and in him was the light of men. So, like I was saying, light signifies goodness. It literally brightens up our world, and goodness brightens the countenance of our souls. In Yeshua, the supernatural power of light compels us to goodness. Okay, that or inside of us, it just compels us to goodness. You know, we just sang the song, the goodness of God, okay? Right. Light just compels goodness. Right. Yahweh the Father defeated the power of darkness and death through his son Yeshua when he raised him from the dead. A death Yeshua willingly took on to complete the will of his Father. Yahweh's good and perfect will was to save us from darkness and bring us into the light. What does it mean that Yahweh is light? I read that in John 1, 1, 5. But th the scripture in John 3, 19 through 21 says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the yes. world and people love the darkness rather than the light. What are we seeing now? Yep. People love, love darkness, darkness, okay? The majority of people, including some Christians, love the darkness. And why is that? The enemy is so sly. He, he entices and he uses, oh, doesn't this look good? Doesn't this feel good? Doesn't it sound good? Doesn't it taste good? Okay? And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that, it, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by Yahweh. Light symbolizes goodness and Yahweh is good. He cannot operate outside of who he is. Well, he can't. He can't yeah. operate outside of who he is. Yeah. So John began his gospel account stating Yeshua came to earth, Yahweh the Son, Yeshua is light, and in him there is no darkness or sin. In the New American Standard Version of 1 John 1, 5, it reads, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness cannot comprehend. Really, darkness does not know what to do with light. No, it doesn't. Okay, it really no, it doesn't. doesn't. You know, I, I, I was in a, a store one time after, maybe a few years after getting saved, and walking through a store, and remember this woman coming towards me, who seemed to be a little different anyways in the natural, but as she passed me, she growled at me. And it was like, and I'm sure some of you probably have had experiences of people growling at you, but, you know, she growled at me. And I remember calling mom and saying, because I was like, what is this woman growling at me for? I didn't even do anything. I'm usually nice. I smile at people when they walk by me. And I did. I smiled at this woman, and she started growling at me. And I was like, why is this woman growling? It's because darkness can't comprehend That's the light. That's right. Okay, and she it, saw the light in it's me. It's exposing. And it, she reacted it's exposing. to it. Whatever spirit was in this woman reacted to the light that was in me Absolutely. to cause her to growl. So get ready. Okay? <laughs> yeah, get, get ready. ready. Get That's ready. just the people growling at you? It's <laughs> just the beginning of things, Hallelujah. okay? So light can be seen by any and all. 
Darkness hides, conceals, and covers, while light exposes truth. Light is powerful and far-reaching, able to illuminate everything. You know, you could, you could be in a total dark forest somewhere, in the woods at night. No, say there's no moon, no stars, nothing. It's dark, dark. You can't see your hand in front of your face. But somebody's camping, you know, a mile away and starts a campfire, and you can see that light. You can see the flickering of the light from that campfire penetrating that darkness. So believers often, often speak of walking through life with Yeshua, but John literally reclined on him at the Last Supper. Right. The one whom Yeshua loved is the way John referred to himself in his gospel account, and he wasn't wrong. John was Yeshua's earthly best friend, the closest to him, even out of the close circle of three who witnesses, witnessed Yeshua's transfiguration. In writing the letter of 1 John, the apostle and faithful friend of Yeshua separated the appearance and manner of soulfully following Yeshua as opposed to the one only speaking the words. John witnessed the true effect of a changed heart after Yeshua. Right. He witnessed the true effect of being exposed to the one that was the light of the and, world. This and. experience, now this is what light does. Darkness confuses. It right. alters. It causes you not to think clearly. It right. blinds individuals' eyes and their ears. Causes people to do things that might not be character to what they would normally do. Right. Okay? This experience allowed him to discern wisely. And that's what we have got to be doing in this, these days. We've got to be discerning wisely. Right. And all honestly... Should have been discerning wisely when we walked into that store the other night. Yes, but, we should have. you know, it was a lesson, lesson learned. learned. Lesson right. learned. I know, right. I know we that just, I know we that. the light. You know, we when, when, if, if, if Australia was with us, both of us would have instantly, it would have been a light year. It was, you know, boom. It would have <laughs> been, we would have saw that turn around and boom, walked out. We should have impacted, we should have imparted that into us. You know, so even, you know, as adults, we've got to, just as on guard as we are with our children, we need to be on guard with ourselves. So Yahweh is good, and therefore all he does is good, and all he makes out of dire situations is good. Moses wrote of Yahweh's goodness and love in Exodus 26, but showing my steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Right. That's another key right there that we could go off on for, but you know, be keeping his commandments. Like right. what I just read, you know, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay, right. how can light fellowship with darkness? Yeah. You can't. Yahweh is light. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Darkness is sin and evil in the world. We see that on earth, that there will be times that are difficult because of the dark curse of sin. Our enemy seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. He is a deceitful liar, but not creative. We live in a world imploding from false information. We reconcile what we know with Yahweh's truth. Light suggests the idea that Yahweh is open and honest. Okay, he is open and honest. That's what light is. Right. That's what or is. It's an open and honest God. Darkness he reveals truth. Light also represents goodness and purity in a moral sense. Okay, all the immoral stuff that we're seeing, that is not of Yahweh. That is of, that is of the darkness. There are no shadows or dark sides to Yahweh. He is perfect and free from sin. Darkness symbolizes deceit and death. Every human heart wrestles with sinful strongholds hidden in the darkness, but the light of the Lord exposes them, brings right. them forward, and frees individuals from them. Light penetrates the darkness instantly. It can shatter a sin like that. It can shatter a sickness like that. It can shatter any curse from the enemy like that. A life touched and guided by the light of Yeshua is evident because of the powerful effect it has on those who are walking after him. It's so like mom said, you know, those of us who are believers, who are sons and daughters of the Most High God, when we're walking through a place, especially in the next few days, 
the tracks of light that we need to be leaving, light that is just penetrating through the darkness. And even if we don't say something to an individual, that light inside of us can cause, suddenly remove the blinders from those, that right. person's eyes and cause them to see clearly. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The world can be a hard place to embrace light and believe in Yahweh's goodness. There are falsities surrounding and dark intentions grabbing for us daily. Injustice abounds and isolation looms. But the one thing that we remember, need to remember that the Lord of Or is the one that keeps all things. Right. And we have that same or inside of us and that nothing will be able to right. separate us from the love of Yahweh that is in Yeshua, our Lord. Right. So the scripture I'm going to end with, for me, it was powerful. It just impacted. But it was back in, in John, in John 1, 4, and 5. And I yep. think I read it last <clears throat> week, but and it's out of the voice. And the voice, <clears throat> the voice says, his breath filled all things with a living, breathing light. You know, there it is again. Light is alive. It is. It's life. Absolutely. Dark is. is death. There's nothing breathing in dark. A light that thrives in the depths of darkness blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and will not be quenched. That is who Yahweh is. This that's ore, who we are. That's who we are. That ore right. sons and cannot daughters. and will not be quenched. Right. We are sons and daughters of ore. Sons we and are. daughters of light. Yes, we are. And we need to make a conscious decision Release of releasing that we light need to release and that knowing light. who we are and whose we are. That's right. As we walk through this more world. More and more now. Okay, more and more now. Than we've you know, ever the had. reality <laughs> is, the truth is, there is a lot of people out there who are, 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 are crying out for help. Okay, right. there's a lot of people out there that are just looking for the answer. They're, look, they, they're saying, you know what, this is not right. A lot of people know that things are not right. The things they that they're seeing do, that they're, that's immoral, they know that it's wrong. Okay, but they don't know what to do. That's right. And we are the sons of Issachar. <laughs> the sons of Issachar. We are the lights, okay? Right. We are the life and the light forces that Yahweh has placed on this earth for such a time right. as this. And we right. need to, on purpose, Mom trained, you know, trained all of us very well in this. And, I, and it just ingrained in me, like when I walked, in, walked into a hospital, you on purpose release. Right. Not only release into the individual that you're in the hospital with the in that atmosphere. room, but you release into the entire atmosphere. <clears throat> That's right. Because this is a whole other rabbit trail, so I'm not going to go there. But hospitals are dark places. Yes, they are. Okay? They can be very, very dark places. But we are the ones who are ambassadors of light. And we need to make sure that we know that and that right. we walk in that. Absolutely. And it will not, <clears throat> cannot be quenched. Uh, one final verse to turn to. I want everybody to turn there. Ephesians 5. This is what we, this is what we do this right. time of year. This is what we do in our whole lives. All the this time. is our answer. That's right. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start at verse 6. Let no one delude and deceive you with empty excuses and groundless arguments for these <clears throat> sins. For through these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of rebellion and disobedience. So do not associate or be sharers with them. For once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk you. as children of light. Lead the lives of those native born to the light. For the fruit, the effect, the product of the light or the spirit consists in every form of kindly goodness, uprightness in heart, and trueness of life. It's not Halloween there. And right. learn in your experience what is pleasing to the Lord. Let your lives be constant proofs of what is most acceptable to him. Take no part in and have no fellowship <laughs> with the fruitless deeds and enterprises of darkness, but instead let your lives be so in contrast as to expose and reprove and convict them. For it is a shame to even speak of or mention the things Absolutely. that such people practice in Absolutely. secret. But when anything is exposed and reproved by the light is made visible and clear, and where everything is visible and clear, there is light. 
Therefore he says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and go haunt your ho former homes. No, he doesn't yeah. say that. <laughs> and Christ shall shine, make day dawn upon you, and give you light. See, that's the opposite of what they're worshiping, the God of the dead, in Halloween. Absolutely. Dead spirits roaming around in the darkness. It's quite the opposite here of his re resurrection life. Look carefully then how you walk, live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. Yes. Therefore, do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. Right. His will is for us to be light in this darkness. Not to be partaking in the deeds of darkness, not to be partaking in the celebrations of darkness, but to be in contrast, to be who we're called to be. It's, it's good to be different. It's good to be different. We're called to be different. We're called to be different. We're called separate. a peculiar people. Separate and apart Separate from, from the world. That's right. And that's how the people will know used to it. where to turn. They'll see the light. Right. They'll see the light and Absolutely. they'll come to him. <clears throat> Amen. Well, Amen. thank you for those of you who joined us today. We trust you've gotten something out of this message. We will see you on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Until then, you have a blessed weekend. You have something?